lovely that we're able to connect all the way from Europe to Japan. It's our morning, and I think it's your evening. Yes. Right. And uh, now the technical problems have suddenly miraculously been fixed. Nothing to stop us having a nice meeting. Okay. We've got a, a bunch of people, and they've all written questions. Well, most of them have written questions. Uh, so it's all in your hands. You can start as you like, and we're in your hands. Okay. Well, who would like to join me first? We have somebody called Lakshmi. Okay. It sounds like they have Indian names. Did you give them their names? Uh, yes, yes, yes. I have a policy to give, if somebody wants a name, I get, try to give a name which uh, reflects some kind of potential I can see. And uh, Lakshmi has this, uh, um, how can I say, she's almost realized her potential in the last couple of days, actually. Oh, okay. Hello, Lakshmi. Hello. Hello, Aruna. It's nice to nice meet to you. Meet. Okay. I have got a question concerning life and death. Okay. Um, um, I'm a mother of uh, three children and um, I gave birth to them. And uh, my, my own mother died some years ago. And um, um, for me, there's a, mi um, um, a miracle between those both ends of the life, you see. Mm -hmm. um, and my mother didn't talk to me the last month so that I could um, um, question her, you see. And what is your feeling about that really big thing? Well, I'll tell you, I didn't talk to my mother for the last several years of her life because I realized that I no longer had to tolerate um, the lack of respect that I received from her and that it wasn't healthy for me to interact with her. So the way I feel about it is that when she passed, um, we had unfinished business. And fortunately, she came to me after her passing in the spirit form and apologized. And that erased everything for me as far as my negative feelings towards her. All of a sudden, it was okay. And I was grateful for what I did get from her that supported me and where I have come. So my feeling is that there's always a positive purpose, even for very difficult situations. And if we can be grateful for that positive, then the rest of it can just fade away and not be an issue any longer. So even if she didn't speak to you, that was what was meant to be, and it's okay. If you can make peace with it inside, then that's the purpose of what needs to happen now. And uh, how can I say, um, I think there's um similarity between coming onto this earth and uh, leaving the earth. What do you, do you think about that? Where do we come from? Ah. Well, I think that our consciousness comes from a different source than our ego mind. And our ego mind is something that we take on from our impressions from our sensory systems when we're in human form. And that becomes our personal story. And that personal story is really irrelevant to our spiritual story, except for the fact that we work out our spiritual story in a human experience. So our consciousness will guide us when we focus on that and we take actions the way we're being guided. Many people receive guidance, but they don't understand it or they don't follow it and they don't have the benefit of what our true self has to offer. But when our true self becomes stronger 
and can not just guide us, but actually move us in the direction that it wants us to go, that things work out the way they're meant to be. And I feel that that's the positive part of, of spiritual path is to become guided and live our life in according to that direction, even if we don't understand it in the process. Mm -hmm. yeah. I see what you mean. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, I think our consciousness is very separate from the ego mind, which has its own programs, its own plans and ideas that are really not necessarily the truth for us. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Hello, Raj. Hi, Aruna. Hello. <laughs> I have a question written down. Dear Aruna, thank you very much for this meeting. Papaji said, don't go back to the graveyard. Yeah. So in my daily life, it seems like everything goes too fast. The awareness seems not strong enough to be like that. Can you please talk about this? Much love, Raj. Well, it sounds like you're just not quiet enough because what runs us is the ego mind rather than the awareness. And when we get quiet, then the awareness has more volume, it has more oomph, it has more energy, it has the ability to actually move our body and, and take steps to where it wants us to go. And so my sense is if we're too busy and too active and too involved, in our thinking process, then we can get off track. We can lose sight of where our awareness is guiding us and become overwhelmed by our daily activities. So all we need to do is meditate. All we need to do is be quiet. All we need to do is self-inquiry, which quiets the mind. And my suggestion is if you have an active mind that's pushing you into a lot of doing, then this is where the self-inquiry can help you. Because it actually does quiet the mind to a point where you can have no thoughts at all. So do you practice self-inquiry on a regular basis? Um, yes. It also got forgotten sometimes. Yes. But I, I do kind of, yeah, remembering, yes. What I found is that it can be very quiet for a while and then get subtly busy and busier and busier until all of a sudden it's in control again. And this gives the ego more um, options as to how to destroy our connection with our true self and how to live as our true self, which is the purpose of all the spiritual work we're doing, how to be our true self in every moment. So whenever that ego comes in, it wants to take control and pull the power away from our true self. And when we allow it to do that, it will get stronger and stronger and stronger. So self-inquiry is a true gift that actually will tell the ego mind, I'm sorry, I'm not interested now. I don't want to hear from you. I don't want that thought. Thank you, but no thank you. And what happens then is it will just eventually get very, very quiet. And you can live your life with no thoughts at all, very perfectly. You don't have to be looking for them or you don't need them because you have this innate knowing that's available from awareness. Your true self just provides it on an as-needed basis. And you can use that to take your next step, even if it's knowing what to choose to eat for lunch or whether it's to make a big plan of what you need to do next. It's all available, and all we need to do is to get very quiet and listen. And when we do that, it will become obvious. And so if I don't know what to do next, I just wait for the next obvious step and take that one. Okay. Thank you very much. So it's the, very clear. 
The key is get quiet. Just go back to self-inquiry. You don't have to do it all the time, but when you notice the ego is strong and it's trying to introduce thoughts into your head, just say thank you but no thank you with self-inquiry questions. And it will take you to silence. And in that silence is your knowing. Konnichiwa. Konnichiwa. Don't ask me a question in Japanese, though, because I don't understand. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Actually, I don't dare to come here, but, but, uh, but, um, you are you living you are living in Japan, so yeah. I just want to meet you actually. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well I love Japan. It's a wonderful place. Mm. And I have always a lot of questions in my mind, but okay. now I I heard you are talking, then I felt everything is not so important. But even if so, uh, I want to be free. Yes. But um, my big kind of wall is um, overeating. This is very big things. I can't mm. control overeating. But if I come here, then it's much better. And then my body became light, but I mm. go home. Suddenly, I eat overeating. I do overeating. Then mm -hmm. I can't control. This is one. And one more, my big like stuckness is to the men. Even if I feel very good and very much open, but suddenly, like uh, kind of intimacy happens with the man, mm -hmm. I became not natural, kind of like going. Uh, not natural, not so feeling resting. Then, okay. if that kind of things is uh, is disturbing to be free, or that it's just not doesn't matter about free free to be free. Well, it is my feeling that. The reason why we have a body is to become free. Because we take body after body to attend earth school and to raise our consciousness to the point where freedom is the next step. And so the fact that you're looking for freedom tells me that that's very important for you. Okay? And the things that happen in your human life are really just lessons that you need to learn to raise your consciousness. Now it sounds like there's some healing that needs to happen between you and the men because if when you get close to them you feel like you need to back away and you're not comfortable, there's something that's disturbing that needs to be resolved. Okay? Mm -hmm. So understanding why you back away or why you feel uncomfortable when you get close to a person will help create the healing that needs to happen here. Because when somebody's your friend, getting close to them should not make you feel like you want to go away from them. It should make you feel even closer. So something probably happened to you when you were young, or it could have been from a past life, that you have something that's triggered by this intimacy. And the intimacy is saying, wait, I can't go any further. I cannot continue to have a relationship with this person. It's coming from a very deep fear that is probably a repeat of a situation that happened before. All right? So my solution for that is to see if you can be friends with people 
in a, in a deep way without physical intimacy and see how that goes. Because you can love somebody and not be physically intimate with them. You, and you can love somebody and be if, it, if it's meant to be that. But if it's not meant to be that, don't push it. Just get true to yourself. Become peaceful in yourself. Become free within yourself. And then it won't matter whether you have intimate relationships with people or not. You really won't care. Do you understand? Yes, yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. And what I know about the Japanese way is that at a certain point, they decide they're not interested in having intimate relations, and that's okay. Mm. So you can just decide it's right for me now or it's not right for me, and then mm. honor that. Okay. Mm. I would say the healing of what happened in the past would take some more work than just a conversation in satsang. Maybe you could mm. actually look for what that is and mm. create a, a specific healing for that particular situation that happened to you. Mm. Okay? Yes. Okay, so there were two things that you asked me. One was about the intimacy and one, I forgot what the other one was. Overeating. 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 No, no, I ignored that because I have the same problem. <laughs> it depends on why you overeat. Are you overeating for comfort? Are you overeating because you just like food? Are you overeating because your hormones are changing? In this particular situation, I think you need to find the cause. If it's because you're bored and you just need to have something in your mouth, you can stop that by just deciding not to do it and having a substitute, something else you like to do instead. Maybe mm -hmm. when you find yourself drawn to the refrigerator, you sit down and you start sketching something or you sit down and start writing about what you're feeling. But find a substitute mm -hmm. because when we're, we're true to ourselves, we actually have the answers inside and we're able to to put them down on paper and see what they are. You may not mm. realize it, but when you're in a different state, like in an alpha state, those answers will become into your awareness. And once you know what they are, you can make different choices. I have found that since awakening, I can actually choose whether I'm going to eat or not eat. Mm. When I find that I want to eat something, I give myself permission to do it. Or I say, no, mm. I don't want to do that now. But I mm. no longer do it out of a habit. I no longer do it to satisfy a need because the needs are not there anymore. It's just habit mm. mostly. And I can say no to a habit. For example, I used to eat ice cream every day every day of my life from a time I was a child. And I got to a point where I had to give it up. And I went through withdrawal, just like people do with cigarettes and other things. I went through ice cream withdrawal. And I gave it up for a long time, but it always was a possibility. And then I started giving myself permission to eat it once a week. Well, that didn't mm. last too long. Very soon I was back to every day. But I go on and off of it. Occasionally I feel, well, why not? It's all right to eat ice cream. It's not a terrible thing as long as I don't go to every day. So I give myself a schedule. And when I know that it's okay to have it and that after a certain amount of time I can have it, then I'm okay with giving it up. So you might try that, giving yourself a schedule. If there's something in particular that, that, that you really love, Say, okay, I can have this once a week or once every two weeks. But get out of the habit which we do to ourselves, which causes us to have weight problems. Mm. Okay? Yes. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> Hello, Radha. Hello. Very nice to meet you. What can I do for you today? Uh. <laughs> <laughs> 
Well, I um, I don't have a particular question. Okay. But um, maybe you can share something about um, what happened to you being with Papaji. Mm. And um, if he gave you advice how to go on with your life or if everything just happened and unfolded for you. <laughs> okay. The reason I went to see Papaji is because someone came to visit me one evening when I was very depressed. And he spent four hours talking to me. He mentioned Papaji, but that was it. He never really told me much about him. But when he left, I noticed that my physical body had gone from depression to bliss. And I was so happy and so excited that I wanted to wake up everybody in the house, which I didn't do because it was three in the morning. But I knew something had changed, and I didn't know what. But this bliss lasted for nine months. And the man who introduced me to Papaji's, the idea of Papaji, invited me to go to a satsang with Gangaji, which I did. And I noticed that Gangaji had taken my next step, which he had become peaceful and very comfortable with who she was. And the, the wisdom that she spoke was her own wisdom. It was not like she was quoting Papaji's statements or from his books or anything. She was living it. And I knew that that was my next step. So when I was invited to go to India to see Papaji, I went there for him to verify my enlightenment. But I wasn't enlightened. I was just in bliss. So when I went there and I saw Papaji, I was immediately startled by him because he looked exactly like my father. Same build, same bald head, same facial features, very, very similar. I could have been sitting with my father. So I was put off by that. And then after satsang, we went into a room where he was introduced to all of the newcomers. And he went around the room and introduced himself to everyone there except me. Okay? So here I had traveled all the way to India to get a validation of my enlightenment, and he ignored me completely. Right? Which was perfect, of course, but I couldn't understand what was happening. So the person that I went to India with went up to him after this meeting and said, you really need to meet my friend. When can you have a talk with her? And he said, how about tomorrow for lunch? So we went to his house, and I actually had a private audience with him and my friend. And that's what changed my life, because he did answer questions that I brought with me. And I talked to him about the bliss, and I talked to him about channeling, which I was doing professionally at the time. And he gave me answers and understanding, and then he gave me a hug. And that quieted my mind, totally. From that point on, I couldn't think, I couldn't talk, I couldn't write a letter. And that was the beginning of the awakening that actually happened later. It happened away from his physical presence, but I had an aha realization which has stayed with me ever since, and it's almost 30 years now. But what I realized in my own years since that time, that Papaji took me to an aha moment. He took me to an awakening moment. But that wasn't complete for me. That was just the beginning of a process because awakening from my experience is a process. And once we have that aha is the beginning of an integration that happens over time. And even though it's been almost 30 years, I still have aha moments. I still have new realizations that come to me which reinforce and deepen that initial moment of awakening. So Papaji lives with me all the time. He's always 
present in my awareness. And I don't talk about God, but I think of Papaji as the divine, and he's the, the true self which guides me. So I would say that your next step is awakening, and the approach to it, as Papaji would say, is to be quiet. Aruna, I would like to come in on something because this lady in the yes. last years, she's had several what you could call awakenings or energy openings, very strong uh -huh. ones uh -huh. where she goes into um, a peaceful space, a joyful space for some time that could be up to two or three months. Mm -hmm. But then she comes out of it again. So could you maybe respond to that? And maybe that's the process that you're referring to, the integration that you're referring to. Yes, because awakening is not a constant state of samadhi. All states come and go while we are in an awakened condition. So one minute we can be feeling depressed and another minute we can feel ecstatic. Everything that comes and goes is not real. It's just part of our personal story. And if we can go through that and be quiet and wait till the next thing shows up, we're experiencing our awakening in an ongoing way. So I would have periods where I'd feel very bland and very, very nothing. And then I would feel very excited about something that appeared, and then it would go away. And it, that is part of the integration, to know that all things that are not real come and go. But the things that are real stay, and that every bliss state also goes. Every negative feeling comes and goes. Every happy feeling comes and goes. But everything that comes and goes is not reality. What comes and goes is part of the human experience, and it's just part of being human. And so accepting it, accepting it all, and making peace with it, coming and going, is the awakened condition. Not staying in one state for a long period of time. Does that make sense to you? And I ask that question because of your experience. You've experienced the highs and you've experienced the lows. And in the awakened condition, both are possible. Both come and go. We don't stay in bliss forever. The bliss is underneath all of those other human experiences. And most human experiences depend on our external experience and what's happening in our life. And all of these things come and go. So to say welcome to everything is where the true peace lies. Even if we don't particularly like it, to be able to say welcome, be present, and just Move through it. Take the next step. My peace is not because I'm in a particular state, emotional state. Not at all. The peace is underneath all of that. The peace is always there. It's always present. And I still feel human emotions come and go. And to me, that is living a human experience as a physical body while the peace is the stillness and that's the consciousness that I am. Okay. So enjoy the, the bliss when it's there. And also enjoy the anger when it's there. Enjoy the sadness when it's there. 
These are all parts of being human. You are not going to be blissful in an ecstatic state forever, nor are you going to be in any of these other states. They come and go. So make peace with coming and going, and that then you're free. From my experience, I also can say it's getting easier to to accept everything. Yeah? Yes. Um, I one of the things that I recommend is asking yourself, "Can I be okay with this, no matter what it is?" And if it's something challenging or difficult, can I be okay with this? And in every case, I can be okay with it. And that's surrender. Even if it's difficult, even if it's challenging, can I be okay with it? The hardest thing for me to be okay with was not knowing, because I like to plan my future. And to sit there and not have a clue what's next was very hard for me. But when I became okay with waiting until the next opportunity showed up, I could be okay with it. And I realized that that's part of my path, is to become okay with not knowing. So it doesn't matter whether we're going through a good time or a bad time. We can be very free and very awake and still have challenging or difficult experiences because that's part of being human. I don't know anybody that goes into an awakened condition and everything is wonderful. Everybody has human opportunities to go through the dark times. And for me, my deepening began after I had my awakening with Papaji because I had a lot of dark times. I was hit by a car. I was hospitalized. I nearly died. I had numerous things that were very challenging happen to me. And when I made peace with them and I could be okay with them, created the opportunity for the next thing to come along. So life is about ups and downs. It's about being okay with everything, even if it's a challenge. And I, I would say that if we're looking to just be in peace and bliss all the time, then we're stuck. Because that's not the awakened experience. The awakened experience is also a human experience. But it's one that we just accept because it is as it is. Okay, so the next time you feel down or upset, just go for silence and acceptance until the next thing comes along. It will make you more peaceful. It will make you more okay. I'm okay with this. Yeah. So I discovered that about six years ago, I had heart failure. And the doctors told me that I could have died. I had heart surgery. And I was absolutely fine with every moment of it. I wasn't afraid. I, I got to realize that this was part of my human experience. And for whatever reason, I needed to have it. And I just enjoyed it. And she couldn't understand why I was laughing so much. Because I could accept it. And it was not an issue for me. And so I want you to see if you can laugh at those things that show up which are challenging and not take them so seriously. Yeah? One of the things Papaji did for me was he taught me how to laugh because I was very serious before I met him. And he laughed a lot. So he got me laughing, and to this day I can laugh at just about anything. So see if you can lighten up and laugh at the things that seem to be heavy or more challenging for you. They're just part of your human experience. Okay. Thank you. 
Hi, Om. Hi, Aruna. <laughs> so far, most of the questions have been going in your direction. Do you have one that can come in mine? This time I got one, yeah. Okay, um, what is So, um, recently and over, over the years also, I've been getting in very quiet moments, um, like memories and visions of which, which are concerned with... Um, with nature's destruction and just a very deep concern about this whole thing happening. And yesterday we watched a documentary about the, um, the overfishing. Mm -hmm. I the saw oceans. that. Yes. Yeah. The sea spiracy, pretty heavy stuff. Yes. And, um, yeah. So, um, this, this triggered that again. And, um, it's like, it's like sometimes in these visions, it seems, as if there's as if harmony exists and if um well the intelligence of the earth or the consciousness of the earth and just the consciousness is well it is the harmony in everything basically and everything is fine everything is fine there's an intelligence that i that we can't comprehend at all with our um, um conclusions that we draw about the observations that we make um, still it's like that these feelings of, of concern, worry, and also hate, hate against humanity, these are clashing with the understanding that everything is fine. And, um, yes, I basically, I don't, there's no directions or no, um, no inner guidance or direction about this, about this topic, even though it seems to be very deep within myself well you are being made aware of what is your awareness of what's happening in the oceans is also added to your awareness of what's happening on the earth i just saw a, a film last night called kiss the ground also on netflix which gives you an idea of what's happening with the soil and the problems that are evolving from that. Our Earth is faced with a climate challenge at the moment that all of us have some way of contributing to. What your way is will probably be inspired at some moment. Maybe not today, but your awareness of it means that something is coming that will inspire you to possibly take some action to help support a change in the environment. Um, what I find is these visuals and things that we get inspired by don't necessarily come in one package with directions. Sometimes we just need to be with it and then an inspiration will show, well, well maybe I can do this or maybe I can do that. And maybe just being peaceful is enough because if many people become peaceful, that energy spreads and the consciousness changes. So I don't know what your specific guidance is going to be, but I can assure you that when the time is right, you will receive it. And it probably isn't right at this moment, or you would have some sort of guidelines that would take you to the next step. It might be choosing to not eat fish. It might be choosing to go on a voyage where you can connect with the ocean and maybe receive guidance that way. There are many possibilities, but whatever it is, follow it. Just know that it's coming from the same place that this awareness is coming from and that you're being shown what your next step is. Okay. Um, each of us has a different role to play. And although your role may be one thing for one period of your life, it can also change. And it, you can have many different things that you do. So I would say just include it in your awareness. Be aware that this is going on and ask, how can I serve? Before I started being in service spiritually, 
I used to work in real estate and it was all about me and my family and how much money I could make and you know my Mercedes and all of this lifestyle which was very materialistic and then I had a realization that I was serving myself and I was not really helping other people in the way that I wanted to so I started praying how can I serve how can I serve and every time I would sit down to meditate I would ask how can I serve and my channeling started spontaneously and I was given information that I could use to serve other people and that grew and took me around the world and it took me ultimately to Papaji but it was the idea of service where I was changing my consciousness from it's all about me and what I can get and where I'm going to to what can I do to help others? What can I do to serve the divine? And then I got a tool that I was able to use for that purpose. And I don't see it as any one specific tool. There can be lots of tools. We can do it to serve our community. We can do it to serve our family. We can do, to do it to serve one person. One of the things I did was I went to visit a man who was paralyzed. And he lived alone in his room with only a nurse to help him. His parents, and he didn't get along, but he had to live in their house. And he had to live in their dining room, which was the only room in the house where he could be. So he saw them all the time, and they didn't talk. He had no friends. So I didn't even know him, but somebody introduced us, and I became his friend. And that was my form of service. And it felt really good to me because all of a sudden this guy had somebody to talk to. And he had somebody to check in with and just tell me how he felt. I mean, it was a phenomenal thing. Um, and so I recommend that you just be open to wherever your spirit guides you to go and you say yes to it as much as you possibly can. And it doesn't mean you have to go anywhere physically, but it means be quiet, listen, and act. Because we can get all the inspirations that we need and never act on them, and we're still not contributing what we're here to do. Okay? So being in service is one of the requirements that qualifies us to graduate from Earth School. When I started channeling, St. Germain gave me a workshop to deliver, and he gave me four things that we needed to do to complete our school on earth. And one of them was to be in divine service. So I figured that that was part of what was important for me, is to devote my life to serving others in some way. Could be many different ways, but service was the key. Okay, so have your awareness expand. See if you can be okay with just knowing this is happening. You don't have to say it's good or bad. You don't have to judge it. This is just what is, and your awareness is becoming aware of it. And that's happening because there's going to be a relationship to it at some point. But right now you're just gaining in awareness. And some of the things that we get awareness of, we can't ourselves do anything about it, but collectively we can. And we don't have to know what that is in this moment because it will reveal itself when the time is right. Okay? Right now, the service you're doing for me is terrific, and I really appreciate it. Uh. <laughs> we need tech guys. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, Pravati. What can I do for you today? Uh, I enjoyed already so much everything you said, and sometimes tears came up because I was so touched. And uh, before I came here to the Open Sky House, I was also um, a bit with channeling and all this stuff. So it was the first that I heard from, from you that you have been a channel. Mm -hmm. And I have 
still a channel. And uh, then the, the question came up, how to distinguish it from the mind? What is intuition and what is the mind? Can you say something about this? Yes. Yes, because one of the things that I realized when I started channeling is that the information was bypassing the mind. It was actually avoiding what my mind thought. I would get things that were very contradictory to anything that I had previously believed. And things that were new for me were fascinating. So I loved doing it because I was in a constant state of learning. And those entities were my teachers. In fact, I did not even know what enlightenment was. I just heard the word. I didn't have a clue. Um, even channeling was new for me when I first started it originally. I had a channel teacher named Bartholomew, and I read his books, and I listened to his tapes, and I never thought I would be channeling. No way. But because of my prayer, I believe that happened for me. And when it started to happen, it started with automatic writing. And I could see that what I was writing was like a, a different person writing to my mind. It was teaching my mind and telling my mind things that I did not know. So I figured it's got to be somebody else. If it's a spirit, okay, that's fine with me. I had a channel teacher. I could let him write. And once I was introduced to him, then I was told I would meet other members of the Great White Brotherhood. And every day I was to meditate for one hour and then start writing. So I picked up the pen after my meditation and it would write and it would be another personality writing in a totally different way with different words and a different energy. So I met on a daily basis all of these new entities and they all felt different. So I got to know them as personalities so when they communicated to me later, I could recognize this feeling that I felt. I could recognize their way of speaking and the words that they used. And then I stuck mostly with one entity named Saint Germain, and he was very consistent in the way he spoke to me. His words were always in a similar way, and I knew his energy, so I, I would know if it was him or not. And I knew that I had to quiet my mind so he gave me some things that I said before I welcomed him and allowed him to use my body. So it wasn't like, is it coming from my mind and repeating it? He actually came around me energetically and used my body. And so I heard what was being said as it was being said. So that's how I channeled. I was conscious. I knew what was happening, and I allowed it. I welcomed it. Is okay. There any, any. You haven't been afraid or something that some something is using your, your body. It was not for your personal things. No, it was just happening. It was just happening. It was like he became my best friend. He was my guide. He was my teacher, and he was my best friend. And he represented the divine realm. And so he was being a messenger of the divine to guide me. But it wasn't just do this and do that. It was teachings. It was teachings that I learned from and teachings that other people benefited from. And when it first started, I didn't trust it at all. And so I invited him or I invited people to come and check it out. They could come to my house with a list of questions and ask me questions that I would give them the answers from my channel guide, and then they would tell me whether it was true for them or not. Any questions at all. And so I started getting a series of people that would come and check it out, and they loved it. They thought it was great, and they referred their friends. So it got to the point where I had so many people coming that I had to start charging for it. And that's when my guidance said, okay, now you start charging. 
And eventually I was visited by some Japanese people who had translated um, Out on a Limb by Shirley MacLaine into Japanese. And they had not met any other channels, so they invited me to come to Japan. And that's how my whole life changed completely. I ended up traveling around the world as a channel. I would go to one place and meet somebody and they'd say, oh, I live in this country. Will you come here? And then they'd say, well, we're, we're having a workshop for you on this date. What is it going to be called? I'd never given a workshop in my life. <laughs> oh, it's going to be called this. I channeled the answer. I didn't know what I was going to teach. I channeled what the workshop was going to be. I was given information that was of service to other people. And so how do I channel now? That's an interesting question. Because after I had an awakening with Papaji, I stopped channeling. Until one day, St. Germain showed up and he asked me to write. And he gave me a reason to know that he was there. Um, and he asked me if, if I would channel some books for him and publish them. So I said, okay. So that was my service. I would continue to channel, but only in written form, and I would publish his teachings. And I thought, well, I have the, the ability to discern, to discern whether these teachings are valid or not. I'll receive them, and if they're good, I'll publish them. And I did, and I published several books of what he called Master's Messages. And I put them on the internet, and I let people buy them. And it was great. It supported my work as a channel. So eventually, I realized that all of a sudden, the wisdom that was coming through me was the same quality as the channeling. And I didn't have to be a channel and let St. Germain do the talking that I could be like Gungaji and I could do the talking. So that made the shift for me to go from channeling St. Germain to just sharing. And now I feel like I channel true self. There's always this identity, well, there's this body and this is me, but true self has a, a total different feeling and flavor. And when that's coming through, I usually get wisdom that the me, the I, ego, was not aware of. And now I can say, I don't know the difference. Because at any moment, true self can interject something or say something. I don't know. There's no difference between me and true self. And true self talks about very ordinary things sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you very much. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. I, I, will, I will also add, when I went to India, I wanted to know where channeling fit with awakening, because I knew nothing about awakening, but I knew about channeling. And I was actually had written a book that was published in Germany. Uh, it was an NLP guide to channeling. And I co-wrote that with two other people. And I was getting ready when I went back from India to teach people how to channel. So I needed to know what the relationship was before I went back so that I could teach them correctly. And I found that there is a difference that you can bring through entities or energies that are not your own ego story and that you can also um, bring through the true self, which is actually a different consciousness more of a collective consciousness than an individual entity. Sometimes okay. when, when I have um, a talk with somebody in the community who is asking something, what do you think about this? Then I have this feeling that it comes from another place and from my... It's like I, I just step by side and I, I just say... And there is not nothing, no interest in that they follow or they should do or that they should judge it or and then this is totally what what i experience sometimes no? perfect perfect it's an offering and oh, it's something that you can do yes 
I think that's great. I think everybody should have the ability to put their ego mind aside and allow their true nature, however it shows up, whether it calls itself a, a name or not, available. So I would say channeling is a step to that. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Hello, Aruna. Hello. Italian accent, huh? I get another treat. Rid of it. Yes. So, so I, I, I have two questions which are related. And, okay. And um, basically, the first is uh, uh, what is your take on enlightenment? But during the session, you have used the word the word awakening, uh, mm -hmm. and the, I would like to, if you could elaborate on that and um, perhaps to say if there is a difference for you between awake, awakening and enlightenment. I heard you saying that awakening is a process. Yes. Perhaps, uh, is enlightenment the culmination of this process? Just to elaborate on this. Uh, something. That's a great question. Very few people ask me that question. But I see a difference between awakening and enlightenment. Because awakening is not something that's just an aha moment. It has to be integrated. The, what has been realized needs to be integrated, and we need to become an expression of that consciousness. And when we become it is what I would call enlightenment. When we let go of all the beliefs, of all the attitudes, of all of the thoughts that are relevant to me, and we become empty enough to be a vessel in service to the divine. That, I would say, is enlightenment. But I don't think that anybody knows whether they're enlightened or not because they never know whether they are empty. So enlightenment is not something that anyone can claim. I had an awakening moment when I was in Papaji's presence, a big aha. I realized that none of my thoughts were the truth. So how am I going to get from none of my thoughts are the truth to enlightenment? I have to let go of what's not truth. But first I had to realize what that was and the difference between what's true and what's not true and find a way to release all of those things that were not true. Now, this almost 30 years later, and I still find things that are not the truth that appear in my mind, that just show up. And I get to recognize them and go, okay, I don't need you anymore, you're gone. So by finding those things and letting go and letting go and letting go takes us to enlightenment. But there's no end here. There's no ultimate well, I am enlightened or I am not enlightened. I would say nobody is enlightened unless they're completely empty. They have no identity. They have no claim on I am a person. And they can just be in service physically to whatever shows up. Now, I don't know anybody like that. Maybe Papaji was. I don't know. I, saw, I would see him have all kinds of emotions I would see him be angry. I would see him be bored. I would see him want to watch a cricket game and it didn't matter what anybody else wanted to do. I mean, he was very human to me, very, very human. And I didn't know Ramana Maharshi, but I looked at him and, and I thought, well, maybe he's enlightened, but I don't know. So I think the word enlightenment, I use it as a in the distant possibility but awakening is a definite process that is ongoing. And it probably ends in enlightenment, but I don't know anybody who, who it's ended there with. Okay. To me, that means becoming true self and living life as true self. But somebody who does that wouldn't claim it. They wouldn't say, I am enlightenment, because their I would dissolve. Okay. And that leads me to the second question, uh, which is, uh, 
what are the obstacles in your view on uh, uh, this awakening process the obstacle which we encounter because my thinking is that uh, very few people really um well as you said probably nobody <laughs> gets to, to be enlightened but uh, even the people who have awakening are very few and far between so what are the obstacles uh, that we as uh, spiritual seekers need to let's say get rid of if we, i can say this way <laughs> in order to uh, facilitate this process? The obstacle is the ego mind and identification with what it has to say. <laughs> when we pay attention to whatever the mind is saying, that can be an obstacle because the mind has its own agenda and it isn't necessarily the same agenda as our true self. So ideally, to strengthen our true self and to convince our mind to be in service to our true self is the ideal way to live a human life. Most of the time, the ego mind is stronger than the true self, and the true self soft and silent, and it may be fully present, but it may not say anything. We may not have heard what it wants us to know. So the ego will use that opportunity to become stronger and stronger. And whenever we allow it to do that, it tries to take over. So we have to become extremely committed to not accepting it, to letting it know that we're not interested in what it has to say, that we're only interested in our true self. And to me, using self-inquiry is the best way to do that because then we can go to this place between thoughts we can be fully present we can be present with each other we can be present with whatever it is that we're focused on and the mind is quiet so the more we can quiet the mind the easier it is to have our true self become stronger become more present become more available as wisdom and that's the, the way to go. And I think, from my experience, the people that are committed to that, they have a chance of having it be solid. But the people that are not, that like to identify with the body and play with the body and do this with the body, they're just not ready for that final commitment, which is, I am true self. And I am in service to others, I am in service to the divine, and that's my purpose for existing. Okay, so I teach the Enneagram because I feel that that shows us our programming. Everything that has been stored in the unconscious mind can be revealed, which gives us the map to see where our ego shows up and how it shows up. And that's where we work, is we take this programming of this is who I am to no I'm not and dump it as it appears and I would say the people that I know which are most conscious are doing that and they become fully present as true self are they awake yes are they enlightened I don't know I don't know to me enlightened is meant as empty now how am I to know if somebody is empty doesn't matter. I If I see them as true self, then that's probably how they're going to show up. So, so you also touched upon the, the, um, the methods. So, as you said, Enneagram could be a, a support or a tool to use uh, in order to, to see yes. the meditations and plus self inquiry can... and meditation. I consider the Enneagram an amazing tool. Amazing because it teaches us who we are not. It is usually taught as this is who you are. This is your personality. And you're born with it and you're going to have it the rest of your life. I see it as a map to the unconscious. It is our programming. It is what is not true about us. And as we see it is when we let it go. And as we let it go, we become more and more conscious of what's true because we now know what's not true. And so I use that as a tool. In fact, 
I was doing an awakening experience with people, and then they would not take my Enneagram course, whether it was too expensive or t took too long or whatever. They decided, oh, I've had Satori. I'm fully enlightened. I don't need this. But they do. They do. Everybody needs to know wh what is in their unconscious so that when it appears, they can release it. And Enneagram is the best tool that I've found that reveals that information. And I don't think you can learn it from a book. I think you need to have a course in it. You need to learn it from somebody that explains it so that you understand the process of how it works. Yeah, because when you realize how it works and you recognize, well, well he's possibly this type, and that's why he's behaving this way, and this is... It, it's a way of accepting people for their programming. Their programming is, is okay. It's, it's not good or bad, but it's just where their challenge is. And if they want to know where they're being challenged, it's available for them to learn it. It's not where we're judging people. I don't find my understanding of people's Enneagram type a judgment at all. I find it where they are limiting themselves and where they could let go of what's not true about themselves. So I see it as a compatible tool along with self-inquiry and silence that takes somebody from awakening or through awakening to possible enlightenment. Whether they ever get there or not, it doesn't really matter. Yeah? To me, being fully awake is to know that you're letting go of what shows up that's not true for me. I can let that go. Oh, I can let that go. So of most of the questions that I receive, it's about letting go. It's about recognizing and releasing what's not true. So that's how I use those two words. I, I actually don't use the word enlightenment very often, but in some cases it refers to being fully awake. Can I tell if somebody's fully awake? No. I can't look at you and say you're awake or you're not awake. But people who are awake have a sparkle in their eyes that I can see. And I, I love it. I love it. When I give my course that awakens just about everybody in the course, I can tell who's awake and who's not because of that sparkle in their eye. Yeah. Okay. You're most welcome. Well, you know, it's interesting. My grandmother was from Ukraine. Wow, really? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I haven't been there. I really don't know a whole lot about it, but I just know that's where she came from. What's her family name? I'm not sure. What was her family name? I know what her married name was, her family name. Sorry. I, I don't know. Sorry. <laughs> is Latvia in, in Ukraine? Latvia? No. Yeah, is that in... It's a... It's a... Soviet Republic in the past. Okay. Bit, uh, north near Baltic Sea. Okay. I have a number of relatives that lived in Russia and some that lived in Germany. Some moved from Germany to Russia. So I know a little bit about my family tree, but not very much because most of my family is American. Anyway, it's interesting for me to pe pe meet people from this part of the world because I really haven't had the opportunity before. So thank you for being here. Maybe we will see you in Ukraine sometime. Never know. Or Germany. Never know. I love Germany. Okay, so what can I do for you? Oh, I have a question. Okay. Um... So as far as I remember myself, yeah, 
there is an, an anger and uh, very often it's a suppressed suppressed anger it's like a okay. basic uh, uh, basic like a background for 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 life okay so recently i kind of became more aware of it and um, trying to express it sometimes mm -hmm. and um, I mean it's a bit new for me and I'm concerned if how people perceive it and um, I'm concerned not to hurt them I'm concerned kind of I'm a bit confused about okay patient and expressing because I'm a kind of big guy and when I'm um, angry it's something maybe too much for what does your anger look like do you explode do you slam the door do you yell um uh, basically I do like this you know with my piece trying mm -hmm. to kind of and it's a spinning spinning inside in the head it's, it's like it's thoughts here it's like a uh, something like a contraction yeah and um yeah I, I don't know, it's like a, a confusion, confusion, you know, because I mean, I have this today in the morning, I have um, something what what is like a provoke me or triggered, yeah? And then uh, I'm in, in my room, I'm alone. Mm -hmm. I don't know. So, so I'm also use this. Could I be okay with it? Yes, I, I can be okay with it. Yes, it's not okay. really pleasant feeling. It's not really, but I mean, I can be okay with it. Okay. What I have found that is that when we are in the process of awakening, our repressed energies appear for us to let go of them. And if we have emotions that have not been felt completely when we originally felt them, they're going to be stored within our body and will show up later when an opportunity appears for them to be released. And the way to deal with it is not to blame anybody else for what's going on, but to just be with that energy, to welcome it completely and to feel it completely. It may take five minutes, it may take five days, it may take five weeks, but if we welcome it and honor it and allow it to burn itself out, it will be gone. That's the release process. It will dissolve itself but only if we're willing to feel it. If we try to push it away and not feel it or pretend it's not there, it stays and it comes again when the next opportunity appears for us to feel it. We have to welcome it and allow it to get as big as it wants to be so that it dissolves itself. That energy actually breaks free and it's gone. It will disappear and it will dissolve. It sounds to me like your anger energy from the past is showing up for release. And instead of trying to put it aside, to hide it, just welcome it. And even if you have to sit with it, sit in a chair and just feel it as much as you can, let it move through you. And if you have to get up and do something, take it with you. Don't try to disguise it. It's not here for anybody else. It's just here for you to feel, for you to let it move through your body and release itself. 
And depending on how long you've been storing it or how big it's become will determine how long it will take to release it. Okay? In my family, I was not allowed to be angry. Just was not accepted. So I held it in and I held it in. And so people would say to me, I feel anger around you. And I said, I'm not angry at anything. I actually didn't even know I was angry. But once I had this awakening, I would wake up in the morning and I would feel rage for no apparent reason. There was nothing I could say was the cause of my anger. But I remember my teacher saying, feel it. And so I would sit in my bed and I would welcome it and I would feel it and it would get huge and would get huge. And it took more than 10 days for that anger to release itself by the time I invited it in. And I just allowed it and I just lived my life with this feeling of rage. And then one day it was gone. And I haven't felt it since. So this is part of my release process, and it can be part of your release process. It could be that if one of your parents yelled at you when you were a child, you took on their anger. It could be that you had a fight with a bully and you took on their anger. It could be anything that happened to you that you got angry about and you didn't fully feel it and you stored it in your body. I do a process called the emotion code, which identifies stored emotional reactions that people can have from previous lives as well as present life. And so they're still holding on to it and it's in part of their body and it makes them sick. It's the cause of major illnesses, but it's a trapped emotion. It's the energy that was never felt and never released. So you owe it to your health to bring in these feelings, welcome them, and allow it to move through and dissolve itself. And it's part of your freedom process because you can't have a free consciousness and have your body all tied up with anger energy. It's still there. Just welcome it and feel it and it will go away because this is part of the ego's dissolving its past. Please try it. I've, I've told this to so many people who are doing it and they are now free of these energies. It worked for me, not just that one time, but at other times when I've had emotions come up, they were very uncomfortable but I welcomed them because I realized the only way out is through. And so I would go through feeling it, and then it would eventually be gone. It can happen for you too. I hope so. <laughs> just promise me you'll do it, because if you'll just welcome it and be with it, let it be present in your body. Don't direct it at anybody else. You don't have to beat anything up. You don't have to go exercise. You don't have to do a thousand pull-ups. You can just feel it. That's the only thing that's required is feeling it and let it dissolve itself. And the most important thing, don't think about the story related to it. If it comes with a story, do self-inquiry with the story. Just be present. I'm feeling anger. I'm feeling sadness. That's it. It's welcome. And then do whatever it is you need to do while it's still there. And as long as it knows that it's not being disregarded or ignored, it can work itself out. And you can be free of it. I promise. But you have to be committed to facing it and feeling it. I've had people been afraid to feel it, but I don't know anybody that has died from feeling an emotion. Not one person. But I do know people who have died by refusing to feel them. So 
So welcome whatever it is that's there. It's part of your liberation. You're awakening your true self by removing those energies. Then your true self is free to be there. You have a very kind eyes. <laughs> Thank you. Maybe it's my Ukrainian heritage. <laughs> 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 Hi. Hello. Hello. And yes. what can I do for you today? It's just such a blessing to listen to the words being said. It's it's amazing satsang today and um well every topic came up was directly directed or related and even if I didn't remember it was really deeply connected to me so it's such a ride thank you you're welcome yeah Ajuna was talking about these deeply stored feelings and um just a question. Um, I have since a very long time a very strong pain in my uh, belly. And I found out for myself that um, if I'm uh, connecting too much with it, it takes me in a deep hole so I can just touch it a little bit. So, but how I did understand you, I have to go all along, all the way with it. But seems to be um, not very productive for me. Okay, so you're talking about physical pain or emotional pain? Well, I guess it I definitely I'm sure it's emotional pain, but it uh, manifests in, in physical pain, like a black box in the middle of my belly, untouchable, very dark. Hmm. okay okay um and have you so sought medical assistance for this uh no never no it's it's just I'm, I'm quite sure it's it's not physical it's psychological because of course yes in in moments of um deep insights or right now it's done Okay. Like if I have a glimpse, it was away for one or two years. Okay. I'm not sure what to say about this. Because if it's emotional, I do a process, as I said, called the emotion code, which clears emotional energy from the past, and we don't necessarily know why we have it, but... The process reveals that. Um, and it could very easily just be an emotional situation. If it's actually turned to physical, then it could have something to do with your digestive system. And I don't want to look the other way from from medical because if it could be medical and there is some help that you can get for it, I would want you to do that. Mm. I'm not opposed to the medical system, even though I prefer natural approaches to things. But I'm going to tell you about something which might be helpful. It's a self-healing process that you do with spirits. It's called the MAP program. Have you heard of this? No. Okay. The MAP program was created by somebody who spent a lot of time at Findhorn, and she learned how to communicate with nature spirits and the plants and the flowers. And she was given this program of where you can call in certain spiritual energies and have them work on you. 
and you do it consciously and if you do it on a regular basis you get scanned and you have them work on you until you're better and I've been using this process for more than 30 years from when I lived in Germany and I've taught it to many people um, because it's self-help doesn't cost anything but maybe the book or some essential oils which he also recommends that you no flower essences flower mm -hmm. essences that if you have some flower essences available you can use those um, but I, I don't use the flower essences anymore I just do it because I feel so good after I do it and it helps my body stay physically well most of the time I'm I'm pretty healthy so this is a tool that I use and I know you can find it on Amazon. You Can you read English? Yes, of course. Okay. So it's in English. Um, the, the name of the program is called um, the Medical Assistance Program of the Great White Brotherhood. And it's from a company called Paralandria, based in the United States. And they sell the book. It's not a particularly expensive book. And you can actually use this program for self-healing. That's one of the things I recommend. The other thing is, if you feel emotions, welcome them and do what I suggested to the last guy I talked to. Um, and if it's something that you feel is definitely emotionally based and could use an emotional clearing, I don't know if there's anybody there that does the emotion code, but that's something that I do and I can do that online. So you have several options that I know and can suggest, but I would also have it checked by a doctor because if it is something medical, it's good to find out about it sooner than it is later. Well, I will do that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I know there are wonderful naturopaths in Germany, so you don't have to go to an allopathic doctor, you could find somebody, I think they call them hyopracticas. Mm -hmm. Yes? So I would check that out and see if someone can assist with discovering the source of it so that you can actually have a full clearing. <laughs> amazing. Okay. Huh? Yeah. I said amazing. The answer. Your answer. Really? Yeah, kind of, yeah. Okay, what's amazing about it? Well, I would never have thought that uh, it might be really connected to a physical thing. Uh, well, emotions that are stuck can create physical things. And I would say never overlook that possibility. If it just requires a checkup, I would get checked. Yeah. I will do that. Okay. And you can be working at the same time on the emotional factor. I mean, if you start to feel an emotion, welcome it in and start to feel it. But if you definitely know there's something there and you put your attention on it, another thing I suggest is when you put your attention on it, just breathe into it. Mm. Put your attention there and and act like you're breathing into it so that you're going to, to breathe and release whatever is there. <sighs> yes. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Hello, Kamala. Hi. <laughs> How can I help you today? Um, I have two questions that came up when I heard you talking to the other guys. Okay. Is, um, kind of about fear, and the other one is about getting too high. <laughs> so, um, yeah, maybe I start with the fear one. Um, so I, I know moments when I meet other beings not only people but other other beings and um we meet and it's just 
the same meeting the same yeah mm -hmm. and then there are people which are authorities for me and i don't dare to have this kind of meeting with them i can see that in myself i feel like i i cannot i cannot dare to go on that level with these people or i should i have to respect or something yeah and uh yeah i can feel how um what a hindrance that actually is in, in any kind of contact with these people okay so you don't feel equal to everybody when you're around certain people they appear to be dominant is that correct they can but also if they don't appear dominant i just make them into this kind of role even though they might be very sweet with me but i don't uh, allow myself to receive the sweetness okay so what would you like to do with this what would you like to happen with them i would like to um to relax and uh, just be be more natural and honest. Okay. Well, relaxing has very little to do with them. Relaxing is something you have to do in yourself before you even see them. You determine whether you're relaxed or not. There must be something about them that causes you to tense up and become anxious. Okay, it might be that you're feeling their energy and that particular energy makes you uncomfortable. All right, but in most cases, you're the one that decides whether you're relaxed or not. And if you're not relaxed, all you need to do is take a big breath and release it. Because anything that shows up in front of you, unless you know it's a lion or a tiger or something that can physically destroy you, you're just assuming there's something that's going to be uncomfortable here. There's something that's I need to be afraid of. In some cases, you may be right. In some cases, you may be completely wrong. Until you get to know how that person is going to behave, you won't know whether they're kind or whether they're not kind. All right. So you have to find out whether you want them in your life or not. It could be that you open your heart to somebody who's very unkind. And then you need to know a way to set boundaries so that that person treats you the way you want to be treated. Okay. So this has to do with the way you feel about yourself. You have to own your power and not give it away to somebody that you happen to meet. Okay. Can, can you talk more about this? How to, because you say, um, kind of you have to choose who to open your heart to, yeah? So how to set boundaries, but not close off to this person. Boundaries apply to everyone. A boundary is about how you want to be treated. So your boundary is people don't yell at me. People treat me with respect. People are kind to me. These are my boundaries. This is what I want from a person. And if they're not going to fit into these categories, then I can't open my heart to them because they don't qualify. They're not willing to qualify to, for me to feel comfortable with them. And you determine that when you meet them. If you feel uncomfortable, don't go there. Don't open your heart to them. The reason I can tell you this is on the Enneagram, there is one type, which is very strong, dominant type. And they lead by anger. 
They're very powerful leaders, but they do it by intimidating other people. They don't do it with kindness and with love. They do it with, I am more powerful than you, and you will do it my way. So I have always been very attractive to people that were powerful. And so they would draw me in like a magnet. And I would go there, and I would get beaten up because... They turned out not to be kind, and they turned out not to be respectful, and I ended up suffering by having a relationship with them. And then I got to realize that my relationship with these people was based on me, not on them. If I could be strong and powerful, I could meet anybody anywhere and not be intimidated. So I discovered the work was in me. And that's what's true about you. The work is in you. You need to respect yourself. You need to honor yourself. You need to only accept people close to you that you feel respected by. And when you feel that way, they're going to treat you that way. But if you feel intimidated and you feel cowardly around them, they pick that up. And that gives them a clue that they don't have to treat you with respect. I often think in these situations, like, you should be open, yeah? Like, anyway. So, okay, this person behaves in a way that is, I don't like it, or I I close up. But I shouldn't miss the message. Maybe there is something that I should be open to. Ah, yes, you can look at the message. And you can also not let them into your intimate sphere, your energy field. If they aren't going to be kind, if they're not going to treat with you with respect, if they're not going to honor what you want from them, why should you be friends with them? There's no reason. You don't have to be friends with everybody, and you don't have to have everybody like you. It's okay if there are people in the world that you're not friends with. And it's not necessarily about where you are, it's where they are. They're not respectful, they're not kind. I don't want them in my life. If they're respectful and kind, they're welcome. But you have to use your intuition and what you you feel about somebody to determine whether you want to welcome them. And you definitely do not want everybody in your life. We live in a world of duality. You need to know that some people are loving and some people are not. And you choose who you're going to welcome and who you're not going to welcome. So saying no to somebody who is not kind is positive for you. And they have something to learn from that. Being honest to them will teach them that being kind is better for them than the way they are. So I say, be honest and be authentic and learn how to say no. And it may be difficult, but the more you do it, the easier it will become. Thank you, but no thank you. I'm sorry, I'm busy. No, I don't want to go. Respect yourself enough to say no if it doesn't feel right. You have an intuitive nature. Everybody does. And if you get in touch with your intuitive nature, it will guide you as to who you can welcome into your life and who you can't. And if you make a mistake and you invite somebody in that you really shouldn't, you can always change your mind. You can say, I'm sorry, this isn't working for me. I'm going somewhere else. I don't think this will work out. However you say it, you can find the kindest way possible, but be honest and don't stay in a situation that isn't comfortable for you, that doesn't support you. And again, how can I then distinguish between setting a healthy boundary 
and running away from situations or people that trigger me and things that I need to look at and where it might be even good to stay in the situation to to see it. Well, I would say take out a pencil and paper and make a list of your healthy boundaries. You can decide right now in this moment how you want to be treated. This is what I want from people. I want to be respected. I want to be treated with kindness. I want to hear honest answers. Whatever it is that's meaningful to you. And if somebody shows up that you have an intuitive sense that don't fit in your boundaries, say no. There's many people to choose from in this world. You get to choose the people you're friends with. Not necessarily your relatives, but definitely your friends. Okay? And honor yourself enough to say no to what doesn't feel good. If you bring somebody into your life and they decide to play rough, say, I'm sorry, this isn't working for me. I do not want to move forward. Honesty goes a long way. And you can be honest so that they get it. And if somebody strikes out at you, whether it's verbally or physically, you know that's time to say no. And you don't stay in a bad situation. Decide, these are my boundaries, and I'm going to stick to them. And if this person shows up and appears to be a threat, well, the odds are pretty good that they're going to be a threat. And I need to say no. The sooner, the better. So it starts with self-respect, honoring yourself, treating yourself well, and welcoming in people that make you feel good, that help you feel empowered, that help you feel that you can do things, that support you. And if they're not respecting you, it's because you're not respecting you. So that's your message. Oh, I'm attracting somebody who's not respectful? How can I respect myself? What am I not doing for myself? What do I need? So it's up to you to decide how you want to be treated and how you want the people in your life to be. And if they don't fit, bye. I mean, it appears to me that your community has a lot of very loving people in it. So, I mean, you have more friends than most people. It's a good place to start. Okay. So, particularly in a dating situation, you never know if you meet somebody, they may be very good looking. They may appear to be very kind and seductive. And then you find out that they're not. That happens. Just be aware that you can always say no. And that you need to be honest and not put up with stuff that is not respectful to you. Because then you're not respecting yourself. Okay? Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, and your name is Nelly, Nilly? I just said I wanted to call myself Runa, and now I saw your wonderful name, Aruna, and uh, it also touches me. <laughs> I was named after a wonderful mountain. Hmm. Nice. From your parents <laughs> or by yourself? Oh, no, Papaji gave me this name. He named me after the holy mountain Arunachala which is supposed to be a manifestation of the Lord Shiva, the creator. Wonderful. <laughs> so, yes, my, what would you like to create today? Um, I would like to talk about love or how I sometimes lose myself in love. And um, 
It's like, I think we all look for love and you can find it in yourself, in other wonderful human beings or in the nature. But for me, it's always getting a bit difficult if I feel like romantic love because I have the feeling I get attached to this person or mm -hmm. like I'm losing myself in this connection because this like calm and pure love, it disappears a bit because I don't know, I have some expectations or something like this. Yeah, and I would like to know what you think about it or feel about it. Well, I think that love is not about attachment. Mm. That love is about wanting the best for the other person and supporting them to be their very best. And that can be romantic or not romantic. And that we can love somebody and not be romantic with them because we want them to be their very best. Okay, so oftentimes romantic love gets kind of twisted because we give our power away. We become so involved in the other person that we forget about ourselves and we don't take care of ourselves. So it's important to not be in sacrifice when we love somebody else, but to love from our abundance our abundance of love where we feel really good about ourselves, where we take care of ourselves, where we do good things for ourselves, and then we have abundance of love left over that we can sprinkle on the other people that show up in our life that we want to share it with. Okay, and to me that is being truly loving. It is not about owning them or possessing them or having them want to be with us all the time. It's about being strong in being a loving person. And sometimes being a loving person means letting go of the person that we objectify as our love object. Because if it's in their best interest to go somewhere else, we need to be willing to support them in doing what's in their best interest. That's truly love okay so wanting to be together with someone should be when you're both aligned and your paths are taking you in the same direction in other words you want to live in the community he wants to live in the community whatever it is that you want to do you both want to do the same then your path is aligned and it works but if one person wants to go in one direction and the other one wants to go in the, in the other direction, that's suffering. And that isn't really love. It's trying to possess. It's trying to hold on to what isn't really there. And if we're suffering, we're giving our power to another person or another situation. And that doesn't work for us. So I say love is about two strong, independent people sharing the best of with each other, the best of themselves. And being together because you're aligned. You feel, oh, I want to do this. He wants to do this too. We can do this together. We can share this time. It's not about giving our power over. And it's not about suffering because we're moving apart because relationships do that. Sometimes they're really together and sometimes they're really apart. And you can love somebody that you don't live with. You can love somebody that's married to somebody else, but it's the kind of love that you share with them that it's not personal. It's just being loving because that's who you are. And that should be the goal, not to have somebody else to take care of you or for you to take care of. It's for you to have somebody to be your loving self with. Okay? <laughs> Thanks. And it's like, I know this, 
like yes. my inner wisdom what you say but it's like sometimes i'm you know losing myself when it's like so strong like you yeah, have this high and then like yeah i get afraid about things but yeah it's wonderful what your you your true self is a great observer let your true self observe you in different situations and evaluate the situation have a check in with yourself from time to time okay how am i doing am i able to be honest fully myself am i giving my power away and then make adjustments along the road if you find you've gone too far into losing yourself take your power back if you find that you're too attached let go whatever it is that isn't working for you you can change you just need to check in where you are so you'll know oh i stepped over the line let's pull it back too much over here time to pull it back he wants to go on a trip sure bye have a good time yeah <laughs> Hi. What can I do for you today? Um, if something um something strong is is happening in me, and I'm I'm able to uh, sometimes it's connected with like a shaking in the body, and when I'm able to um absolutely accept it, then the shaking gets like a super warm um nice feeling, a bit like like honey in the body or something. Mm -hmm. And um, when I'm alone with this, so for example, when I dance and strong stuff is coming up, then I'm able to uh, to fall into and to accept it and kind of transform it. And um, like swimming in this in this high energy in the body. Mm -hmm. But if the same is happening with with people, it can happen that I fall totally out of myself because this energy is um, is getting so strong. Wow. Okay, it sounds like a shift in vibration that's happening to you. That it could be kundalini energy rising. Are you familiar with what kundalini energy is? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah? When I was 17, I um, took a strong drug and uh -huh. then this um, started. Okay. Well, kundalini energy, once we open that door takes over and it's not something you can necessarily control it has to work its way through so that we become comfortable living with it and when that happened to me it happened years before i started having shaking and things happened later but when i found it uncontrollable i went to see a kundalini yoga teacher who taught me that getting on my hands and knees and rocking backwards and forwards would help bring it into balance. I don't know if you've ever tried that, but just hands on the floor, knees on the floor, and rocking forward and backwards for a while would settle it down. And eventually it stopped that intensity but it sounds to me that that's what's going on for you, that your, your vibration is going up really fast from the kundalini, and you need to get it into a smoother shift. And if you find that it gets too high, just rock. Go into a position that you can get it smoother and lessen that intensity. Okay, I'm not an expert on kundalini. I don't pretend to be, but I have had the experience of the kundalini opening. Um, it happened to me many years ago and then continues to happen periodically. And and when yeah, that happens... Totally, uh, totally away. And then um, it, it comes again and... yeah. Yes. Yeah. I don't know of any cure for it. 
except this rocking helped me. And sometimes I would just lay on my bed and feel it. And when it first started for me, it, it was really stuck behind my heart. And I would be in bliss and then I would have pain because it couldn't move. So I read a wonderful book by Osho about Kundalini energy. And I don't know if his books are available to you. They used to be available in Germany. But if, if you can get some information about Kundalini, I think that would be helpful. Because that's what it seems like is happening to you. Can you relate to that? Yeah. Now, I know people that have had their kundalini open for many years and are not fully awake. So I don't think that kundalini awakening is the ultimate, but I do think that it's something to happen to people that are in the process of awakening. And, and as I said before, awakening is a process that continues ongoing. So it sounds like this is what's happening. That's what you've described to me. All right. So if you can find a way to smooth it and integrate it so that you can live your life without getting too high, you'll be fine. But I do know people that... Peaks, huh? It gets, um, it's the peaks when it gets really strong. For yes. A time. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's when you need to exercise. That's when you need to rock. So doing this, actually, if you can do it outside, it would even be better if it's not winter. And you can do it on the ground because that helps earth you and bring you into harmony with the earth. That's even better than doing it on a rug or on a floor. Do it on the grass or on the ground. And I highly recommend a book about the Kundalini energy. <laughs> Some people, it actually affects their brain. And that doesn't have to happen if you can manage it. And what I'm suggesting is, is a way to manage it. And I'm sure there are others. But if you know anybody who teaches kundalini yoga, you might want to ask them. They might have other suggestions. What I recommended worked for me. So I never sought out anybody else for more ideas. But if that doesn't work for you, keep looking. But look for people who understand Kundalini. Okay? Hello, Janus. Hello. What can I do for you today? I noticed that uh, during the day, when I work, I work at the guest house. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that I get in kind of like thoughts over thoughts and it just continues. Uh, and I kind of get lost in that. So I just imagine stuff like, or I think about the past while I'm doing the work and I'm not really present in the work. So I was wondering how I and stay more with myself and more focus, focused on the work. Well, what you're describing is actually activating your ego. You're giving your ego room to play. And that's the opposite of the result that you're looking for. Okay? By thinking about other things, thinking about the past, thinking about the story, it's saying, okay, ego, have a good time. So what you need is the opposite of that. You want to let the ego know that you're not interested in those thoughts. You're not interested in the past. 
you're not interested in anything that it has to say because you want the stillness, the silence, and the inner peace. You want to be present in the moment with what you're doing. Okay? So, take a deep breath, and when you hear the thought, ask, who are these thoughts for? Okay? And if you get silence, stay there. If you get there for you, ask, who am I? So once again, if you ask, who am I, the answer to that question is silence. It will take you to silence whenever you ask the question. Keep going back to silence and allow yourself to stay in the silence as long as you can until the next thought arises and then start again. This will take you to a quiet mind and presence. You will be in the here and now. You won't be thinking about the past. You won't need any stories about the future, the past, the present. You're just here. And you're giving the message to the ego, I'm not interested. Be quiet. That will give you the presence that you need to function at your best and to receive inspiration and wisdom and all the other positive things about being your true self. Because that's what you came here to be. Okay? You're welcome. Okay. Saraswati, what can I do for you? Um, so my question, uh, sometimes I want something and I don't get it in this moment. How can I stay in my essence and forget about it? Be satisfied with myself. Love, Saraswati. Well, I don't know that anybody gets what they want in the moment on a regular basis. So it sounds like your parents must have spoiled you a lot when you were a child if you got everything you wanted in the moment. <laughs> <laughs> Was that true? Um, I don't quite remember, actually. No? Okay. Well, life does not generally bring us everything that we want in the moment. And for us to think that it's supposed to or will do is a fantasy. It's a an idea of what might be nice, but in, for most people, it isn't the case. Except maybe ma magicians know how to do that, but normal people have things come and go, and some things they want and some things they don't want. So looking at you, you look like a very normal person. So <laughs> I, I wouldn't expect that, that everything you wanted would come to you right away. Okay? And the best thing to do is to put your desires out there but not be attached to results. Okay? Oh, I'd like to have this. That's generating energy. That's reaching out for something. But your true self is the one that's going to decide whether you get it or not. Not your parents. Not John David. Not the community. Whatever it is. You're here to experience having and not having. So you can move towards the things that you would like to have, but you're going to suffer if you're attached to getting them. So the best thing to do is just be okay whether you get them or you don't get them. It would be nice to have, but if I don't have it, I'm fine. I mean, that's the truth. The truth is that everything that is false is what comes and goes. And the only thing that is really truth is with us always. It's our true self. And if we focus our attention on our true self, and we love our true self, and we're in service to our true self, we live our life 
on behalf of our true self. With that energy, all kinds of possibilities arise. But we don't necessarily have to know what's going to happen. In fact, it, when it shows up as a surprise, is usually the nicest way. Yes, yes, definitely. So I just can can put out and then let go about the result. Yes. Yes. You do what you feel in the moment is the best thing that you can do in service to others, in service to the divine, and you live your life giving. And I'm not saying give everything. Give from your abundance. Give from what you don't need. But be present and show up for other people. Give your love. Give your appreciation. Be there. That's all you need. And whatever shows up as a result of that will show up. And you deal with that. You respond to it. But you don't try to manifest it. That just causes suffering. This is one thing that I have against New Age teachings, where they teach you you can have whatever you want. So if you want a new house or a new car or a new dress, whatever it is, you just think about it and it's going to come to you. That is not my experience in life. It is not the life experience of most of the people that I've worked with. In fact, I can't think of anybody except one person who did get what they wanted and then they got a very bad disease which killed them at a very young age. So I would say offer what you have to offer and be grateful for what appears without being attached to what that's going to look like. And that's where your joy will come, because you'll have a life full of wonderful surprises. Okay? Yes. Thank you. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Yes. What can I do for you today? Yeah. Um, my, my written question has been answered, so now I have to come up with something uh, spontaneous. And um, actually, I have a, a quite similar situation, like somebody else who has a body uh, a body problem, who has this black hole in his belly, and I have another uh, spot in, on my on my back in the height of the heart. Yeah, I have there something, and I have it um, since twenty years. Okay, so, it's physical. Yeah, but probably it's physical and emotional. Yeah, so like okay. everything. And I knew that you talked already about it, but maybe you could just uh, um, talk a bit more about it because I find your words yeah very wise and um, helpful. And maybe you could just um, address one more time also how to be, um, until it's solved, how to be present with something like that. Yeah, because there is something uh, like, um, yeah, be present with this maybe body and emotional feeling and at the set, same time be present with presence. <laughs> yeah. Yes. This makes sense, yeah. Well, I re recommend approaching it both a medical way and an emotional way because I feel that our physical health is affected by our emotions and especially if we have emotions that were trapped in our early life or in a previous life we could still be carrying energy of that which is festering in our physical body right now so i believe in natural approaches to things and i recommend always checking with a doctor who uses natural treatment, if you possibly can. And it also can be something that you can work on using the MAP program, which I described the book called the Medical Assistance Program of the Great White Brotherhood. And in it describes exactly what you need to do for self-healing with the assistance of some spirits. Very, very helpful. 
So you can do that. But I would definitely have that checked. Now, emotionally, if it's an emotional thing, the process that I do is called the emotion code, and it works with a magnet, and it, it actually releases trapped emotions. Um, it's something that I do as a private session. Usually takes about an hour and 15 minutes. Yeah. I'm thinking about English because I usually do it with translation. So, so in English, about an hour to an hour and 15 minutes. And that's something where we can actually focus on that particular problem and see if there are any other emotions that are involved that could be causing that. And because of my channeling ability, I'm able to look at past lifetimes and other causes that may or may not be evident in the present life. But um, this is what I can recommend. I don't know... I don't know any other sources of emotional clearing right now, but there may be some even in your community. How, whatever people do to, to deal with that sort of thing. Okay? All right. Healing-wise, I don't call myself a healer, except I try to deal with emotional stuff that doesn't need to be present anymore. It's time to let go of that. So the emotional clearing work I do, let's go of it forever, which helps. Interesting now that you said this sentence, so it's uh, time for it to go. Something lightened up in me. Ah. Maybe me. So maybe it's time. Yeah. Good, That's good. The sentence made me very present and very light, yeah. Okay. Okay. Now, another thing you can try to do is you can talk to the part that created that, the part of you that has a consciousness, and you can ask that part, what is the cause and what do I need to do for you to disappear, for this to disappear? See if you can have a, a conversation and get some insights and also, with the MAC program, one of the things it teaches you is how to use kinesiology to get answers. So if you're not familiar with kinesiology, that uses kinesiology to guide the process. And it's very helpful. Great. Okay? Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> I wish I could say, just do this and it would be gone, but I uh, don't... Me too. Bring <laughs> I don't bring those kind of miracles to my satsangs. <laughs> well, God decides when it will go. So It does. And sometimes we need to know about something that can help. So, okay. Thank you. Thank so you. Hello, Maha. Hello. How can I help you today? I don't have a question. I just wanted to sit with you. Okay, that's fine. So why don't you tell me something about yourself? I wanted to challenge myself and come here because it's not so easy for me. That's true. That's true for all of us. I don't know anybody that can say life is always great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And I can assure you I've been through my share of ups and downs. And a lot of times I have no idea what the future holds. And sometimes it seems very obvious and then it can change. So I don't really know. And that's okay. Because life is not meant to be static. It's not meant to just be smooth and easy. We're meant to have a multitude of experiences. And sometimes our most powerful lessons are in our most challenging experiences. Yeah. And sometimes if it's with a kid, it makes it even more challenging. So um, I have one child which is extremely successful and another child which is so challenging we haven't spoken in years. So you just never know what you're going to get or why you get them. And the lesson 
is always there. It's up to us to discover it. And for me, I found that the lesson is letting go and allowing them to have their own life experience, which is right for them, even though I don't disagree with it. I don't agree with it. Yeah. So it seems to me that if you are still dealing with anxiety from your life experience, that belly breathing is very good for you. Breathing and exhaling. Breathing and exhaling. Because when we're uptight or we have a lot of tension, we just breathe into the upper part of our body. And the rest of our body doesn't get that energy that comes from the breath that's really helpful. So the things that I recommend when we have a lot of anxiety, and the reason I can tell you this is I used to have a lot of anxiety. Breathing, good diet, and sleep. And allowing yourself to have sleep in a dark room with no lights is very helpful. And a lot of deep breathing. Yeah. So, And when you're facing and confronting a situation, that's when you should breathe. Breathe deep into your belly and just relax. And what I do is I will sit at that time. That's, I don't always meditate, but I do sit. And I sit and I just breathe so that I can be present and in that space. And it helps bring me back to presence so that I can move forward. Yeah. I can feel your anxiety. I can feel it. And I know that breathing will really help. And I've been recommending this MAC program. I also recommend it for you because you can do a MAP session and you can ask for help in relaxing. Just help me relax. I want to be more relaxed. I want to be more present in daily life. The MAP team can help you with that. Whenever I do a MAP session, I always feel wonderful afterwards. And then I'm able to carry that feeling with me for several hours at least. So if you have that kind of relationship with the spirits that are around you, it will support you in everything else that you do. And relaxing is one of the places to start. Okay. The other thing is to breathe into the area that you're feeling uncomfortable. It will help release the tension there. In order to be liberated, we need to be able to relax. Because if we're full of tension, we're not free. We're tight. We're uptight. Relax. Very important. And there are many ways to do it. You can do it with meditation. You can do it with exercise. You can do it with yoga, breathing, lots of things. So I would put a big sign on my refrigerator that says, relax, as a reminder. And whenever you see it, just take a breath. <sighs> And release that tension. Yeah. Shake it out. You don't need to carry it with you. It'll help your health as well. Okay? Okay. Have we done everyone? You've, you've overdone everyone, I think. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Thank you. A big, a very big thank you because... Um, it was really uh, a huge, uh, wonderfully informative and fantastic energetic meeting. And it's just lovely to feel with this Zoom that it's so intimate. Yes. So now, after this long meeting, I feel the person I met uh, 25 years ago in Lucknow uh, <laughs> is not any different from the person I'm meeting now in essence. So... Mm -hmm. You know, it's been a beautiful meeting in essence. And I really give you a big, big thank you. 
Uh, it's also reminded me of some judgment I have which is the world needs more female teachers because it's very lovely that your wisdom comes in a very feminine and sensitive package. Oh, okay. Ah. Well, I don't know about that because I really don't know people who are teaching. I live pretty isolated here in Japan. And other than the people that I met also in Lucknow and a few in Colorado, um, I'm on my own most people don't know about me so right, i'm kind right. of a secret person well for some strange reason my life is you could almost say exactly the opposite to being alone because uh -huh. i've been li living in a community of 20 people for the last 16 years with many visitors uh -huh. and for some reason i've been guided to meet many teachers interview many teachers, and then write about many teachers. So a mm -hmm. um, very different style of life, maybe. So this thing about the value of woman, I mean, it's come to me through meeting many female teachers as well as male teachers. And I always okay. find there's a special quality from the, the woman because there's something very delicate, very sensitive, and... Um, it has a completely different quality in a way to the male teacher. And maybe it's time in the world to welcome, um, how can I say, it, just to be open to this other possibility. So I very mm. much enjoyed the fact that every question is not answered very differently to how I would answer it, but it's got such a lovely feminine package around it, which I can appreciate. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it's fun to do it because the questions are really similar questions to the ones I get here in Japan. Right. And I, I do have people from different parts of the world that join my satsang when the time is appropriate. Um, right. I actually started working with people in, on different continents before I came back to Japan because I hadn't been here in many years. It wasn't the right time when I had my initial awakening. So now it feels like it's time. And I may be moving on somewhere, and I'm not sure where that might be. So right, we'll see. Right. 